and so I, I regard myself as a bit of an interdisciplinarian. So it's one, so so it's good to see some science, some of those scientific types or environmental manager types here. And I could give you 20 or 100 examples, but I'll just give you one. When I started here, <coughs> way back in 1986, one of the first people I came across was a now retired professor called Doug Butterworth. And Doug is an applied mathematician, and why would I connect with him? So let me talk about fisheries management, an environmental issue, managing the world's fisheries. There's two big decisions you have to make in fisheries management. How do you determine the size of the catch for a particular season? How many tons? That's the total allowable catch. And secondly, how do you allocate, how do you divide that cake, the 10,000 tons between different uh, stakeholders? So Doug, right from that beginning, was <coughs> regaling me on the importance of science to determine the total allowable, allowable catch and whether the then Fisheries Act. So, and then there's also at the time, I remember, uh, there was the uh, quota, the, the Demont Commission of Inquiry into Allocation of Quotas. So I'm very pleased that Maurice Demont from Weber Wenzel is here, because his grandfather, I think, was the, um, was your grandfather, Maurice, that was the chairman of that commission. So from that, but coming back to today, now coming to today, just in the last month or two, there's been a case, and normally the cases have been around who gets which quota and disputes around with the quota, but for the first time there's now a case led by Marius on, um, on determining the total allowable catch. And the gist of the case is that Judge Rogers said that, uh, and I have to say quoted me, I think, uh, <laughs> said that, uh, that it was irrational not to, not to take scientific advice. And I could give you many examples, but I'm not going to do that. The third general thread is that my career has been one of peaks, where I've flown, and then big troughs. And troughs have been associated with periods of Great Depression. Now, I wouldn't mention the word depression because it's taboo, not really spoken about, but I have to because of the tragic death earlier this year of one of UCT's leading and the country's and in fact international scientists. He took his own life, as you know, uh, because of depression. And I'm, I'm, I really think we must start talking more about it. I'm pleased to see that there's posters here about students, student wellness, is supposed to be about visiting a psychologist for students, but I think the staff also need that. So I'm, I'm happy that that initiative has started. And I'm glad that the two deputy vice chancellors here will be taking that initi initiative further. So those are three common threads that run throughout my talk. And I just wanted to sort of give you the executive summary quickly. When I started, <clears throat> this is going to be my conclusion as well. When I started to run it off, Environmental law, in the words of Dennis Cowan, the late Dennis Cowan, was a subject struggling to be born. And he and I used to sit for hours in his lounge down here in Mowbray, him drinking lots of whiskey, me drinking a little bit, his <laughs> wife, <laughs> and, 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 and thinking about how to, and that was in the, 80s, in the, in the late 80s, anyway, I'll come back to that. Um, and we've done with the full circle in that today, I've got the feeling that we're now trying to develop a new branch of law, and that's climate change law. It's, uh, it's a lot of similarities. In those days, there was no, there was, there was a disparate collection of laws, and so is, um, but we're in good hands, by the way, because uh, one of our members of staff, Olivia Rumble, who's somewhere, she was uh, in the initial stages of of drafting the new climate bill, which is hopefully going to become an act one of the days. So, in a way, there's a lot of similarities between environmental law being struggling to be born those days and climate change law, which is now the big, the big um. So, before um, I go further, I must explain this rather odd title. A passenger on the Good Ship Institute of Marine, and I put brackets environmental because the name environmental only came later. Uh, where, what, what, this is a rather odd title. So, this is to do with one of my troughs, my period when I was a bit down. Um, I happened, this is about eight, nine years ago, I can't remember. I happened to bump into Hugh A. Moore in the corridors. Hugh A. Moore is that guy you all know, he's an institution in the country. He's the guy who probably kept you, graduated from here. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, I said to Hugh, Hugh, I'm, I'm not really able to pull my weight anymore feeling down, I burnt out. 
and Hugh says, listen, I want to tell you a story. And this is, of course, not yes, sir. He says, uh, I was talking to Harry Oppenheimer, who was the former uh, vice chancellor, or chancellor of the university. He says, Harry Oppenheimer and I were having a chat, and Harry Oppenheimer has compared UCT. He said, Anglo-American is very like UCT. It's a big ship, and we can carry many passengers. So please stay on board, and I managed to stay on board, so I'm happy to be <laughs> So what I'm going to do in the 35, 35 minutes or so available, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Institute of Marine Environmental <coughs> Law, how it came about, and then I want to mention my formative years. Every psychologist tells you that what's important is the first seven years of your life because that shapes you, and that certainly shaped me. But I won't do too much there, thankfully. And then I'll mention my student, UCT student years, my 10 years in the real world, which Hugh alluded to, and then about half of my talk will be on my academic years at UCT. Um, so, the Institute of Marine Law, why this grand name, how, how did it come about? So, in the decade of the 70s, the international community uh, negotiated the biggest treaty ever, 300 articles called the Law of the Sea Convention. It, it was adopted in 19, after a decade of negotiations, it was adopted in 1982. And at that time, bear in mind the late 80s, South Africa was an apartheid state, pariah state, there was a gentleman at Foreign Affairs, today International Relations, who um, was very interested in Law of the Sea and did his best to represent South Africa's interest at the Law of the Sea negotiations, which took a decade, the whole decade of the 1970s. And he retired more or less in 82 from 1982 from the Department of Foreign Affairs. And he did a very wise and unusual thing. He persuaded his old department to, to give UCT an annual grant to set up this Institute of Marine Law to monitor developments in the world's seas and oceans. You know, the world's seas and oceans, as you know, 70% of the planet, so they perfect weather conditions and everything. Um, and so he was also quite strategic because that grant was used to pay his salary after retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Charles Fincham to thank for setting up the Institute. Later on, it became marine and uh, environmental was, was added. Um, and I'm very pleased that his daughter, Gail, who was a staff member at, um, at UCT, she's now retired. Where are you, Gail? Uh, somewhere there. Where are you, Gail? We, I think we must offer a little thanksgiving to your dad for founding this institute. So send up a little prayer to heaven. Thank you to Charles Vincent for setting up the Institute of Marine Law. Because I wouldn't be here, you guys wouldn't be here, etc. So thank you to Charles Vincent. So, um, Charles, when he set off, he's, he employed a research assistant, a research officer called Fran Late, and um, then, sadly, he passed away. So, the, the faculty then employed Derry Devine. Many of you will know Derry Devine. He taught us Roman law and international law when we were undergraduate students. He took over as the, as the director of the Institute of Marine Law, and he changed its whole tenor from a research, from two research people to a teaching institute. And um, I knew Fran, she had studied law as well. We knew her as students, Lindsay Madden, who's here, he'll remember her as well. I decided to, I saw this job advertised. I was just finishing the masters which Hugh mentioned in environmental studies. And I was thinking of what I'm gonna do now. I'm probably gonna have to go and join a law firm. I'd done my articles in Johannesburg. I was like a big heart, I was going to go back to join a law firm. It didn't really attract me, do some conveyancing or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> so I went to say goodbye to Fran, and I'd seen this job advert, and, and it was International Law of the Sea, and I thought, well, I'll be to right. I went to see her anyway, and to say goodbye, because she was getting married, and the purpose was coming open, so they were advertising that. And she put a whole different slant on the job. She said, no, no, Professor Devine is going to lecture at the International of the Sea, but, she, but, but he needs somebody to teach coastal zone law, which I didn't know anything about. But I realized that coastal zone law was environmental law of the interface of sea and coast. 
So then I became completely passionate about getting the job uh, and avoiding going to legal practice. <laughs> um, I recollect uh, Dennis Davis, who was then on the staff, passing me in the corridor and saying, you're going second! <laughs> <laughs> of course, <laughs> don't get me. But, um, so, apart from Derry Devine, um, who was my mentor for 15 years until he retired in 2000, I want to mention Richard, Richard Fugel, who was the head of environmental and geographical studies at that time up in the upper campus, uh, or co-author of Fugel and Rabi, and then Andre Rabi, who, who was the first writer about environmental law at Stellenbosch. They were my mentors, but of course also Dennis Carlin, who I mentioned. <coughs> So, it's not the mistake, not too difficult. <laughs> Our next theme is... <laughs> <laughs> so, I did think, I did think of a sexy topic I would talk about, very relevant, decolonizing the law of the sea. The DVCs would have liked that. Uh, but, and it would have been a very easy topic to talk about because the whole law of the sea is actually about colonization. Right from the early explorers, Columbus, De Gama, they all started the business of colonizing the planet. So it would have been an easy topic to talk about. But I thought I'd rather talk about myself. <laughs> But it is, it is interesting how the sea was colonized. And in, in, um, uh, you'll recollect from, our, from, from the law students here, we should know about Grotius. Uh, he, he's the one that followed up in foot, foot, foot steps. Uh, not so but Grotius, who's the, one of the fathers of our Roman Dutch law, was also instrumental in, in the current law of the sea. He wrote a treatise called Mare Liberal, The Seas Shall Be Free. There was tensions until the present day between coastal states' jurisdiction over the waters from their, from their coasts through to um, uh, tension between them, coastal states, and, and the rights of, of free passage navigation. Um, so so that's, that's one of the main themes of the Law of the Sea Convention, to put that centuries top, topic to bed. So the reason I thought I would blow my trumpet a bit is because I, we could also put on all my achievements, where's you, the chair, on, on my tombstone. But I've already actually decided what it should be on my tombstone, and that is, I told you I wasn't feeling well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, I want to spend uh, three minutes now talking about the first seven years of my life because, I, as I said, they are formative. Now, this picture here, I don't know if you can see it, is taken, my, my parents came to South Africa as immigrants. They, had, they were from a wealthy land-owning family in eastern Poland. They arrived here. My father spent the war years in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, my three sisters were born at that time. One of them is here, Vanda, sitting there. My older sister, um, thanks for coming. They were born in the Middle East, and my parents arrived in Durban by ship in 1948, the year that the National Party came into power. And anyway, fast forward, I was born in Paul, and um, this was a so-called farm, actually it's a gravel patch, where I grew up, near Durbanville seven kilometers or seven miles out of Durbanville. And these are my, the laborers' children were my playmates. And as you can see, my academic career, I don't know if you can see that, started early because I was already thinking out of the box then. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, where am I? Thinking out of the box. Okay, so, my f <laughs> so the other big life event that has shaped my career, my current career, was at day zero. I was born a hemophiliac. I was diagnosed at birth as a hemophiliac. And why was that? Because the eldest, my eldest brother, who would have been older than Vanda, he died in the Middle East of hemophilia. So when I was diagnosed, um, and I don't know how much you know, when I was born I was diagnosed with hemophilia. 
I don't know how much you know about hemophilia, but it's a blood, it's a lack of a blood clotting factor. And people say, so when you when you when you cut yourself, you bleed to death. And I said, right. Um, <laughs> but actually, the real problem is internal bleeding. So right since childhood, kicking soccer balls, etc., um, I would I would have internal bleeding as a result of which all my joints are damaged. I have two replaced knees, a fused left ankle, and one of my first projects on retirement was to deal with my right ankle, which is now very painful. So. Um, and the way of treating uh, hemophilia is to inject um, the blood clotting factor. So if you donate blood, they, they take out the fraction of blood that I lack and they put it in. Now this uh, wrecked my early plans of my career because I planned to be a sportsman. Uh, in fact, I used to be an avid rugby fan in my growing up years. I used to collect from my father's back page of Farmers Weekly pictures of rag rugby players. There was John Gainsford and fruct de prayer, and I used to stick them up on my wall, and Morph Meyerberg, although I'm not sure what Morph meant in, in those days. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that, that cut me out. I couldn't be a professional sportsman. My father, in turn, being an immigrant, said, education, 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 they can't take that away from you in the part of South Africa. So I always was, had to go to my books. Um, but another, an important life event then was that my mother took ill uh, and she had cancer and after a year she tragically died and um, my father the bereft widower who really was a fish out of water married at the Catholic, there was a, woman, a family at, the, at, at our local Catholic church with eight children whose father died and you can guess what happened my father very bravely marries Mrs. Edwards so here I am with three older sisters and suddenly acquired four Eight, four stepsisters and four stepbrothers. Eight plus four. If that's not enough, being good Catholics, they had two more children. <laughs> so I have 13 siblings. Now why am I telling you this? What's its, re what's its relevance to academia? Can you think of its relevance to academia? Can you think of a better nursery ground for this, the rivalry, the, the rivalry that, the king to, that happens in academia, the one-upmanship, the complaints, why is, my, why is my bedroom, why do I have to share my bedroom with three people? Why do I have to share my office with, you know, four people? <laughs> why is he getting more pocket money? I'm only getting this, why is he getting this research grant? I'm, so all of this, <laughs> all of this, this perfect nursery grant for academia. I mean, <laughs> so in the words of Henry Kissinger, or to must quote Henry Kissinger, in my case, the, 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 the I've lost my place. Um, the benefits of being, um, the quantity of children was inversely proportional to the available resources. Um, <laughs> so then, to move to my, very quickly to my student, UCT student years, um, my father was very worried about, uh, he didn't want me to do law firstly because he said you can't take it away, you can't, I had to run from my country. He wanted me to study medicine but I spent enough time in hospital so I didn't want to study medicine. My father wanted me to go to Stellenbosch. I didn't want to go to Stellenbosch because I heard about the terrifying, I was terrified of the initiation there. I got into Volkhono, but I came to UCT, although my father thought it was a communist place. So, anyway, um, so uh, it was a fairly, Hugh Corder was here at the time. The main events I'll just highlight was in my second or third year. There were police on the steps. I was holed up in the library because I was not aware of the thin skull rule at the time. If I got a baton on my head, I would have been halved completely. Um, and it's interesting to note. By the way, one of the advantages of being a hemophiliac is that you are entitled to a disabled bag. So it's very <laughs> <laughs> trouble parking. So now two years ago, after this was in my student years, but two, during the student protests, very disconcerting to find all of these, but this police van in my, in my, to say, <laughs> <laughs> so, now, then as you mentioned, I spent a bit of time in the real world, uh, I had a staff dean's beer, it's a government bursary, that is why I went to Inland Revenue um, in Pretoria, uh, a lot of my colleagues with the same bursary became prosecutors, and I went with lead feet to Pretoria, but I actually had wonderful time there because all the English speak English speaking people clubbed together very soon and although I was banded as a communist in my in the tea room at work, uh, I used to hang out with all the progressive journalists, including 
people from the Rand Daily Mail where I had been offered a job. But I decided at that time I just got a grant to go to London to do an LLM. So I didn't take it at Rand Daily Mail, and perhaps I would have. But I did come back, and as Hugh mentioned, I did my articles with L.U. and Hall, which were the main media lawyers. The senior partner there was Kelsey Stewart, who's written a book which is in our law library called The Late Kelsey Stewart, who wrote a book, um, Newspaperman's Guide to the Law. Um, so then I left Johannesburg and I came back to Cape Town, possibly to join us, a law firm. I had finished my articles. Uh, but then I decided to do something out of interest. And I remember debating this, should I do this Masters in Environmental Studies? And I went to see my friend Guy Preston there who lived in Hart Bay. And when I walked into his lounge, there was a fish tank, but not with fish in it, with sand and beetles uh, walking around. And I said to him, Guy, what's this? And he said, these are Namibian beetles, tenebroid or something, what are they called? <laughs> uh, and they're amazing. I said, well, why have you got them here? He said, no, they're amazing because, now he lives in Hart Bay. He says, because they've adapted to to water shortages. And what they do, and I don't know if I should demonstrate this, in Namibia at least, they, they climb up the sand dunes and they point their bums uh, towards the mist, the incoming mist from the sea. And they have little runners down their side um, to, to collect water. So I was fascinated by this and I started talking to a guy about ecology, and what I didn't really know much about, ecology and adaptation. And I said, how can I find out more about this? And he said, well, do this master's in environmental studies. I said, really? So I did it. No, I did not do that Masters with any career in mind. I simply did it out of interest. But it did then completely change my, my direction. So it was then that I, um, that I moved to... Because um, in that class I got all the legal questions. Why is this person allowed to do that? Why is that happening? So how long have I taken? 25 minutes. Okay, so now the last few... Now I move to the meat of the topic. Having done the real world, I'm not back in the aerial heights of UCT. Um, oh yeah, I just, it was strange because during my real world, I remember going to a holiday down in the Trans Sky, and I was working in Land Revenue, and I bumped into Neil Ackerman, the late Neil Ackerman, who was a year ahead of me, of us at Law School. And I was chatting to him in the Trans Sky Coast about how I didn't really enjoy my work in Land Revenue, and I didn't know what to do. And he said to me, what do you really want to do? And I don't know why, I just blurted out, oh, write a book on environmental law. It just came out, out of nowhere. Um, many years before I actually did that. Uh, so, I put in bold here, 1985. Because 1985 was a watershed year for me. Anybody born in 1985? It was a very important year, a watershed year for me. 1985, there are a few youngsters here. <laughs> um, in 1985, my, four, my forefathers were battling with solidarity in Poland. South Africa was in a state of emergency. I, in January, I had just learnt about this job here, which I was dying and hadn't yet received, dying to get. That was all in 1985. But the biggest life event in 1985 was in January 1985, where I was diagnosed HIV positive. And um, the background to that is my girlfriend at the time and I began reading about the strange new disease, the three, which affected the three H's. And then it was strange, it was mysterious, affecting the three H's, the homosexuals, the hemophiliacs, and the Aetians. And so, and being a hemophiliac, we get blood transfusion, so that is why we are in the danger zone, as it were. So my girlfriend persuaded me to go and have a test, and there weren't any available, but I did turn off to the only place where it was available, at Tigerberg Hospital, where I remember going up the lift and being accosted by the person, the doctor who did the test, a young guy. He didn't even invite me to his office. He stood at the lift and he said, you HIV positive. I said to him, what does it mean? And he said, what are the implications? He said, well, hang on a bit. He went back to his office, brought out a book, a big silver book, thick book, term, he said, and called immunology. He said, yeah, read this and bring it back. I never read it and never brought it back. <laughs> uh, but uh, I cannot describe the sense of desolation you feel when you, at that point, at that time. My first thoughts when I walked across the parking lot back to my car, can you guess what my first thought was? You know what to say, huh? 
No, no woman will sleep with me. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's turned out to be the case. <laughs> but I also thought, I had thoughts like, my best friends won't want me to eat, to, to eat off the same plates as their children. It was a state of, as I say, I can't describe, it was a state of this plague. The doctor who told me said he's going, he's going to leave because he's coming to Africa and he's, he's going to go to America. So I had to live with that. I could write a whole book on that, but I won't. Except to say that I did give some talks much later at, to the UCT community. I remember once um, a, a law student was in the audience, a fine year law student, and she came to me afterwards, knocked on my door. From, she was from Soweto, and I thought you'd come to get some help because I'd said to her, if you need some help with your tutorials or whatever. And she came to tell me that I'm the white professor, she's the black woman from Soweto. She could not tell her parents, she could not tell her friends, but she could tell me that she was HIV positive. And I couldn't then broadcast it. She was failing her exams. So it was very because of confidentiality. So it was, I could talk more about this, but I won't. Um, I'd rather talk about now, um, about my achievements. One, <laughs> I'm scratching around for them. <laughs> okay, the first one I want to talk about was, I started my job in the late 86th, and I started in about 86. My first job was to, to do these lecture notes on Kirsten's and Law. So I'm scrambling around to trying to do a master's course on Kirsten's and Law. But in that time, I kept anything that I, that I could find on the link between environmental rights and human rights. And I kept a little file which I called human rights, sorry, which I called my dream file, in the hope that one day South Africa would throw off the yoke of apartheid, etc. And it, it must have been in 1989, I got a phone call from a so-called Bockwachter or nature conservation official, a very progressive guy called Chris Brown, who was working in Southwest Africa. And he says to me, we are working on a new constitution for Namibia. Well, it wasn't then Namibia, it was Southwest Africa. Can you help us with something about the environment? And I remember saying to him, uh, how many months have I got? And he said, three weeks. So fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, I've been keeping this file, and there was some literature in the library, and I cobbled a memorandum together. I sent it up to Chris, and he then did his wheeling and dealing, and we got some into the Namibian constitution not in the Bill of Rights, but in the Namibian Constitution, as some of you might know, has a principle, a, direct, a chapter called Directive Principles of State Policy. So it's in that chapter. Um, but it was the first uh, constitution in Africa which mentioned the environment. Namibia went independent in 1990. And, sorry, yes. And that was the same year that Nelson Mandela was released. So then I realized, or I foresaw, that the same, what possibly, and hope would happen in South Africa. So I set about putting a lot of energy into researching environmental rights. My colleagues, including uh, Hugh Corday here, were researching administrative law, rights to property, uh, socio-economic rights, education, right to education, health rights. Very few of us were involved with environmental rights, but it was my passion. So I, re I recollect um, getting some advice from Jeff Budlander who told me that the Indian law report I must look at because the Indian constitution has a right to life and the courts there have extended the right to life to the right to a decent environment, etc. So I ran about doing those things. I remember flying at that time, the Commonwealth Institute in London had a, a conference on environmental rights generally, being I was, the, I was at the right place at the right time again. Um, and the 11 hour flight and I had a 10 minute slot talk about environmental rights in the new South African constitution, which was one of my first publications eventually. And I remember then interacting as well with so-called terrorists uh, like L.B. Sachs and, <laughs> and Carter Osmol, the late Carter Osmol. Um, and L.B. Sachs wrote a very seminal paper at the time, You Don't Have to Be White to Be Green, which gave a big impetus for environmental rights to be incorporated into the constitution. So I'm happy to say we eventually succeeded in getting an environmental right into the Constitution. And of course, I could s spend three lectures doing this. I introduced, uh, okay, I won't do that. Uh, but all those purple uh, highlights are what, what is controversial, what could be discussed further. Um, but you can now do a master's in the subject, or you can do your, uh, choose your environmental law option with Amanda Gonza, I'm doing that course now. 
and um, <coughs> so that was a significant achievement. But then, what I didn't mention is when I was done with HIV positive, <coughs> 34 minutes, 10 minutes to go. <laughs> Uh, what I didn't mention, a few years after I was diagnosed with HIV positive, I went to Dr. Gary Martin, who was setting up an immunology unit at UCT. I said to him, Gary, tell me, tell me straight, how many years I've got to live? He said, how old are you? Right. He said, oh, well, statistically, let me have a look. And he said, four years. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, okay, I will try, I won't. <laughs> Subconsciously, I must have decided not to get married, not to have children, but what I'll do, my legacy will be a book, environmental law book. So I set about writing what became environmental law in South Africa, and that came out in 2000. And I remember while writing it, I mustn't get sick, I mustn't get sick, I mustn't get sick before I finish it. But I finished it and I never got sick, I just got post depression. This is my baby. This is my baby. Um, so then I started teaching environmental law at the LP level, persuaded, well that was right before that, I persuaded Terry Devine that I should do environmental law at the master's level, every second year in the coastal zone law every other year, and um, I'm pleased to say, and then I introduced environmental law as an optional course at the LLP level, and um, that is, I think it should be a compulsory course, I think it's at WITS, it's compulsory at the LLP level. And so and now it's in the capable hands of, of Amanda McConzo, who's teaching it. I've often wondered, what effect has my teaching of environmental law had on the environment? Has it been useful? One day I was in the lift at uh, the Cape Bar, Huguenot Chambers, 18 floors, so it's a long lift. You can have lots of conversations in the lift. <laughs> and the chap, a costume in a suit, tie, etc., says, you taught me environmental law. So I said, oh, really? And I didn't recognize it. So I said, uh, I hope you learned something. He says, oh, it was a fantastic course, man. I met my wife there. <laughs> so, um, I, do want, I do want to, I, I don't know how to say this, but the most <laughs> complimentary remark I had about this book was um, was from Patrick McClawson. He's a professor at Birkbeck College. Of London. Is Stephen Beresford here? Yeah. Right. So you would know. Oh, you would know. You would know Patrick McClawson. So he he reviewed my book and he said something incredibly co uh, complimentary. He said that he referred to the case of Rylands v. Fletcher, and he said that in Rylands v. Fletcher, Mr. Justice Blackburn took and that was in about the 18th century. I think, took a disparate group of laws and, make them in, and made them into a cohesive law of tort and law delict in England. And then he said, Glazewski has done the same in South Africa. He's taken a disparate group of laws and put them into one cohesive whole in this book for an environmental law of South Africa. So why I mentioned that it was tort law was that Anton Fagan <coughs> couldn't make um, tort laws delict law, as you know, most of you. And Anton Fagan couldn't make this lecture, but I am looking for something to do next year. So maybe I'll do the same for Tort and not more for his pedestal. So other quick landmarks, I've got about eight minutes left, I see. I was special advisor for a year and a half to uh, Bali Musa, an unpaid leave. And it was during the, the plastic bags levy saga when we wanted to pay for the plastic bags. And I remember Gerard Erasmus saying to me, he's a colleague from Stellenbosch, he says, Jan, what is happening, man? He says, when, before you went to, 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 to work for Valley Wizard, uh, you had to pay for condoms and plastic bags were free. Always <laughs> 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 turned upside down. <laughs> One of my highlights was after the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg in 2002 was there was a judges training course and I met, um, got involved with um, the late Arthur Chaskelson, the most wonderful man to work with. We ran judges training course and it was very satisfying to a few months thereafter to see the Constitutional Court 
uh, hand down the most influential, I think, leading environmental law case, fuel retailers talking about sustainability, etc. Um, so the lawyers actually you know that uh, you should kick the dust. I'm sorry, you should have an in loco inspection when there's a case in front of you. Always good to have an in loco inspection. My mentor, Richard Fugel, used to talk about going to kick the dust on the environmental sites. And part of my international environmental law course is to talk about Antarctica and the Antarctic continent, which you can see faded here. At one stage in the post-war period, they were going to cut up Antarctica into slices of pie, a bit like a scramble for Africa. It's South Africa had a claim at one point, but it abandoned it. Um, anyway, there's a whole lecture you can come to on Antarctic Treaty System. Today, Antarctica is basically a world park. But I decided that it's a, it's a lovely course to teach Antarctic law, Antarctic Treaty System. There's about five conventions which make it up, <coughs> starting with Antarctic Treaty in 1959. I decided I have to go and get the dust off for an in loco inspection. Go <laughs> down to the and have a look. So, but I was a bit hesitant because being a hemophiliac, I thought, well, what happens if I need treatment or I have to be flown off the sea and maybe they don't want me? And you have to cross the Drake Passage, which is very rocky. So I phoned my doctor, Mike Detoy. He's my hematologist, or was. And I said to him, won't you please phone the fish? The, I gave him the number of the ship's doctor. I said, won't you phone him and discuss whether he would have a hemophiliac on board? So Mike says, nonsense. We're going as well, he and his wife. <laughs> Why don't you come with us? So there I had my personal physician on board. <laughs> <laughs> had a wonderful time exploring Antarctica. So thank you for that, Mike. So the last um, highlight I want to bore you with is a recent book. Hydraulic Fracturing in the Karoo. And this is the kind of epitome of multidisciplinarity. It's, it's myself and an environmental manager from the University of Free State who are the editors, but there's about 25 chapters ranging from hard-nosed scientists on the one side, like Alison Lewis, the head of the Dean of Environment and the built in Engineering in the Built Environment, talking about fracking fluids, <coughs> written with lawyers like myself, about the right access to information to know what's in the fracking fluids, right through the whole spectrum to humanities people, to middle of the road people, like Loretta Ferris who wrote a very interesting article, uh, chapter in this book on a sense of place in the Karoo. She wrote about the, the term which is quoted from an Australian case, solastalgia. So a whole uh, chapter on, on the importance of the paleontology and the archaeology of the Karoo. Thankfully, we were in a campaign not to, not to go fracking in the Karoo and it seems it won't happen, but not for any reasons of this book, but because of it's just there's no much uh, shell gas there in economically payable quantities, although they're still researching that. Um, so I'm nearing the end, but it has been satisfying again to have uh, to do influence the, the youth. Um, in my I was invited about two years ago, year before last, to go by the French Constitutional Court to assist in a global initiative to develop what the French call a pact or treaty for the environment, uh, spearheaded by the French. They, as you know, they spearheaded the Paris Agreement, the climate change one, and now they're spearheading this. And so we had uh, youngsters like this also promoting uh, Youngsters like this. <laughs> so, as I mentioned before, and I'm nearly near the end, um, when I started, we were looking at the um, distinctive principle of environmental law, and today we must look at uh, climate change. That's the, the biggest challenge of our time, I think. So I hope uh, we're in good hands here. We have the most dynamic unit at UCT, the ACDI, the African Climate Development Initiative, uh, exploring climate change, adaptation and mitigation, etc. So, my concluding remarks, this is the last slide, I said most of that. I hope that the law of the sea, which has now been kind of over, Graham Bradfield is thankfully still teaching law of the sea. I think it should be maintained. We have a wonderful uh, competitive advantage here at UCT with the interface of two oceans, 
we've got a dynamic department of oceanography. We should maintain as much as possible in the area of scarce resources a foot in the law of the sea. Um, a number of people have asked me, what am I going to do after I retire? And this is a question that's bothered me a bit as well. In fact, last year I was on a trip to Eastern Europe to my roots, to Ukraine, in fact, with a town called Lviv, which uh, Philip Sands has written about. I was there actually with Philip Sands. And I noticed at the market there was a wizened old fortune teller, a wizened old lady, a fortune teller. And uh, so I said to her, so what, uh, what do you think, my broken Polish, <laughs> what do you think I should be doing in about a year or two? I'm retiring. She looked at her car and she said, don't worry, the big court will help you. Said, what? The big court? I said, no. I said, the you have the Constitutional Court. No, yes. It was a nice talking nonsense, and I left. But actually, I've realized that she was right. Because the Constitutional Court has created a gap for me, not as an assessor, not as, a, as an intern, but I have a plot of land in McGregor. I'm going to grow cannabis. <laughs> Medicinal purposes. <laughs> <laughs> so my final remark, um, about a month ago, Judge Wallace was talking uh, here uh, about the law of delict, and he used the but for test. Some of you were here. So um, I wanted, you know, I said earlier that about eight, ten years ago I was talking to Hugh Moore, I was thinking of leaving. But the point is this, is the but for my wife Louise, but for Louise and all the support I've gotten from it, I would have left 10 years ago. So any clap that's due is due to Louise rather than you. Thank you. responsibility and pleasure to uh, express a vote of thanks to you, a collective vote of thanks from all of us here, for a galing and reflective lecture. You've clearly had an incredibly rich, intriguing and extensive career here. It frightens me to think that I was about four years old when you graduated. <laughs> <laughs> You'll also be pleased to know that our program still promotes blooming romances in the classroom. Oh, <laughs> You've inspired many. The audience here is reflective of those you've inspired, students, people working in practice, people working in government. You've touched their lives, and uh, I think you'll continue to touch them beyond your, your, your time here. If I was to describe you, I think it would be the Institute's uh, quintessential nutty professor. <laughs> <laughs> we will miss our quintessential nutty professor, and we will too miss those hushed and excited whispers in the corridors, <laughs> where the students catch a glimpse of you on the far side for the first time, <laughs> expressing, is that me? <laughs> so may retirement bring you much joy writing novels under the shady trees, exploring the Polish landscapes on your new ankle, and tinkering in your garden in McGregor. I was going to say perhaps planting a few vines and a few olive trees, but perhaps a little bit of cannabis in between. <laughs> So you know what happens when, when someone presents a lecture and it relates to IML? What do we have up? Get a bottle of wine. <laughs> so many of those here have probably received a bottle of IML labeled wine. But um, this is a special lecture. Oh. <laughs> And we hope you enjoy the selection we've chosen for you. Thank you again. And before we leave, I'd like to express special thanks to, to Gaby Ritchie, yes. who dealt with all the logistics for this evening. Yes. A round of applause for Gaby. <laughs> and on behalf of the Faculty of Law, I'd like to invite you down for a refreshment in the Faculty Common Room to celebrate again 
a long career. What is that? 43 years at UCT and still going strong. So please do join us. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. So we one floor down. Thank <laughs> you.